Hello everyone, this is Mr. Baxley and I'm recording this history lecture video for Como Picton High School. Today we are going to talk about the 1980s and specifically we're going to talk about a president named Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan is the defining character of the 1980s. If we look in the 1980s and we want to see, you know, what the era was about, if you can understand who Ronald Reagan is, you can understand the 1980s. So, to do a quick recap, we talked about the 1970s in the last video, and we talked about how that was a period of a lot of social change in the United States, but a lot of problems, okay? There was, you know, kind of a depressing mood to the country towards the end of the 1970s. In the 1970s, the United States lost faith in their government as the Vietnam War ended, in failure as the United States found out about the government lying about the Vietnam War and with the downfall of President Richard Nixon who had betrayed America's trust in the Watergate scandal. In addition, economic problems like stagflation and economic problems in the economy throughout the whole country had been really bringing a lot of people down. And a lot of people were divided in the United States over social issues, and many people felt that the country had gone too far in a liberal direction and wanted to return to conservative direction. At the same time, in the late 70s, the United States had to deal with the Iranian hostage crisis, where 52 Americans were captured for 444 days in Iran and tortured, and the United States government was helpless to stop them. So the 1970s, especially the late 1970s, is kind of the depressing part of American history in the late 20th century. It's where the United States is down on its luck. We get beaten down over and over again for different reasons. But in the 1980s, optimism returns. People start to realize that, you know what? We don't have to be so sad all the time. We don't have to be so sad about all our problems. We have things that we can be optimistic about. The United States was filled with hardworking, caring, patriotic, God-fearing Americans. They're a country based on freedom and they're the most powerful nation in the world. Yes, we had an enemy in the Soviet Union as an evil empire, but Americans realized that they had the character and the ingenuity to take on any challenge. Now, this was a different way of thinking than the 1970s, where people just felt like there was no hope. And this different way of thinking came to the United States from a kind, charismatic, and kind of grandfatherly figure who exuded optimism, just, just poured off of him optimism. He looked for the best in things, and he had hope for change in the United States. And he honestly restored a lot of Americans' hope in their own country. And this man was Ronald Wilson Reagan, the 40th president of the United States. Reagan was the dominant force in U.S. culture and politics in the 1980s. That's why some people refer to it as the Reagan era or the Reagan years. In 1980, in the presidential campaign, he pushed a message of optimism and confidence in the American people. He told Americans to believe in themselves because he believed in them. He promised to return the power of the government to the people by reducing taxes and regulations and allowing people to have more economic freedom. During the 60s and 70s, we have an expansion of governmental power through the Great Society and other programs. And Ronald Reagan wants to bring the government to a smaller size. And with a smaller government, he reasoned that people would have more freedom. His political message included a strong belief in the strength of America, and he believed very strongly that the Soviet Union was evil. He did not want to be friends with the communists. He believed they were evil. And on the area of Iran and the Iranian hostage crisis, he made a very firm promise during his election campaign that if the hostages were not released, there would be serious consequences for Iran. And he ran against Jimmy Carter, who was the president who let those hostages be captured and who had failed to rescue them for almost a, for over a year. The day that Ronald Reagan took office, Iran released the hostages. So that tells you that they took him seriously. Reagan appealed to working class Americans who were looking for law and order and moderate Democrats who wanted strong foreign policy. In addition, everyone was being hurt by inflation in the economy, and so they thought that Ronald Reagan could change the economy 
And so Ronald Reagan built up a massive coalition that demolished Jimmy Carter in the presidential election in 1980. He won 489 electoral votes to 49. And at the same time, Republicans managed to win control of both houses of Congress. So for the first time since, you know, at, right after Dwight D. Eisenhower, we have a full Republican government. And even when Dwight D. Eisenhower was president, we didn't have a full Republican government. So it's been a long time since Franklin D. Roosevelt in the 1930s, who brought in a wave of Democrats into governmental power. It's not until 1980 that you have Republicans kind of take things back. So Republicans look to Ronald Reagan as their leader, and Ronald Reagan is a very charismatic leader. Here's a picture of him. Ronald Reagan is known as the great communicator. He actually was an actor before he got involved in politics, and his acting skills and his people skills and his humor made a lot of people like him, even if they weren't Republicans. He was very good at making people laugh and getting lots of people to like him. For example, Ronald Reagan was shot by a man named John Hinckley. Here's a picture of, you know, the, the shot happening right after the shot was over, you know, the Secret Service moving to defend him. And whenever Ronald Reagan was brought to the hospital, he lived. And as the hospital, the doctors were working on him, he managed to say, I hope you are all Republicans. And Ronald Reagan, honestly, just has like a joke for everything. He was a very funny president and he was really good at using humor to deflect criticism. He was able to use humor to get, you know, people would be angry at him. He'd tell them a joke, they'd start laughing, and then they'd forget about why they're angry, or they'd move on. He was really good at working the press with humor. Now, Ronald Reagan was also known as the Teflon president. You know, Teflon, non-stick, nothing sticks to him. Okay, so you saw in 1980 all that red from his presidential uh, election in 1980. When he ran for re-election in 1984, he ran against a much younger opponent. And during the debate between Ronald Reagan and Walter Mondale, they, uh, there was a question asked of Ronald Reagan that said, you know, are you too old to be running for president? Ronald Reagan responded by saying, I'm not going to make age an issue in this campaign. I'm not going to exploit for political purposes the youth and inexperience of my opponent. And if you get a chance, go on YouTube and look up the Ronald Reagan Mondale debate where he talks about age and the age question. Because with that joke, everybody laughed. Everybody thought it was hilarious. And instead of thinking about how old Ronald Reagan was, they started thinking about how young and inexperienced his opponent was. They all had a good laugh and Ronald Reagan wiped the floor. 49 out of the 50 states voted for him. Ronald Reagan is a very quotable president. He's got a lot of quotes. He's got a lot of funny little sayings. But in many ways, he was able to use jokes and to use humor to get across complex political messages that were easily digestible by people. And it got a lot of people to come around to his way of thinking. Government's first duty is to protect the people, not run their lives. You know, He doesn't want the government to ru rule over everything. He wants people to have freedom. Ronald Reagan was socially conservative. He was anti-abortion. He was pro-life. And he said this, I've noticed that everyone who is for abortion has already been born. One way to make sure crime doesn't pay would be to let the government run it. He believed that the government was a problem and it would be better for the private sector to run things and to get the government out of the economy. The nine most terrifying words in the English language are, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. And it's just all, just jokes all over the place. As long as there are tests, there will be prayer in schools. Ronald Reagan, he's a very humorous president. If you get a chance, just look up some of his jokes. He's a very funny president. And it was a way that he gained a lot of popularity. Again, he's using media, television, things like that to push his political agenda in a way that was very popular. Now, Ronald Reagan's main economic policies become known as something called Reaganomics, okay? He is the first president since the New Deal to ever propose a reduction in the size of the government. His plan was to create a better economy by getting the government out of the economy. So instead of having new and new programs to fix the economy, he says, let the economy run itself. The government is just getting in the way. If we let people do their business, 
They'll do it better, more efficiently, and smarter than the government can, and the economy will grow as a result. So he pushed for a 25% tax cut, reductions in regulations, and reductions in government spending. The idea was that if rich people have tax cuts, they can spend and invest more of their money in businesses, which would then stimulate the economy and create jobs. Okay, if a billionaire all of a sudden has an extra million dollars, now he can go and buy himself a yacht, you know, a big fancy boat. But when he does that, he is giving people jobs. Somebody's gotta make the boat, somebody's gotta fix the boat, somebody's gotta operate the boat. So by letting people at the top of the economy have more money and have less of it taken away in taxes, they'll spend it and get people jobs. This will increase the supply of goods and thus reduce prices to end inflation. Inflation was a very bad problem in the economy during the 70s. And during the 1980s, Ronald Reagan fought against inflation by increasing the supply of goods. By taking away taxes, there's more money in the economy, there's more supply being created, and that will lead to a reduction in prices. And it worked. This policy was known as supply side economics, Although some people like to call this trickle down economics, where you give all the benefits to the top and then it trickles down to the people at the bottom. And there's still a lot of debate today over whether supply side economics was effective or not, but let's just look at some of the results. So, the Reagan tax cut boosted growth. You can see that the economy grew in 1983 by 4.5% per year. But then in 1984, boom, it jumps up to 7.2%. You have a huge jump in the growth of the gross domestic product. And you can see the same thing on the number of jobs created. In 1983, you have around 600,000 jobs. Then you have that tax cut. All of a sudden, you have 4 million jobs created in a year. The next year, almost 3 million. The next year, almost 2 million. And the economy starts rolling. And in the 1980s, the economy boosted out of the stagflation problems that happened in the 70s. There were just too much government intervention. And by taking that government intervention off the back of the economy, then the economy could grow, okay? Now, the downside to this is that we have an increase in the national debt. Ronald Reagan was responsible for a large growth in the national debt because of the reduced taxes, but this was offset by the growth in the economy, okay? Ronald Reagan would have argued that by letting the economy grow more, you can have a lower tax rate but actually get more money because people are making more money. Ronald Reagan is notable for being the president to nominate the, appoint the first woman to the Supreme Court. Her name is Sandra Day O'Connor. She was appointed in 1981. She said, do the best you can in every task, no matter how small it may seem at the time. When it comes to diplomacy and the way that he dealt with the rest of the world, Ronald Reagan kind of harkened back to old Teddy Roosevelt in big stick diplomacy. He sought to increase the size of the US military to prevent threats. This kind of helped lead to the growth of the national debt because we started spending a lot more money on our military and the Soviet Union had to keep up. But as the United States spent more money, the Soviet Union had to try to spend money to keep up with us in the arms race, but the United States economy was strong and growing, and the Soviet Union was struggling. Their communist economy was falling apart by the 1980s. And it goes back to incentives. In communism, there's no incentive to work hard. In America, with capitalism, if you work hard, you can get a promotion, you can get more money, and you can go spend it the way you want. But in the Soviet Union, where the government owns everything through communism, there's no incentive for you to work harder, okay? It's not the same amount of incentive. So people are not encouraged to be productive. They just want to avoid getting in trouble. And so that leads to the Soviet Union's economy overall struggling. And there's a lot of problems with the way that the Soviet Union government operated, the way that they managed the resources was inefficient. And by the 1980s, the Soviet Union is really collapsing and we didn't even realize it until it finally falls apart at the end of the 80s and early 90s. Now, Ronald Reagan viewed the Soviet Union as an evil empire. And in the 1980s, as communism is trying to hold itself together, they start to expand communism across the world. 
The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, which was leading, like we talked about before, that was leading to a lot of destruction of Soviet military equipment and loss of Soviet soldiers' lives, and the United States helped Afghanistan fight against the Soviet Union. Nicaragua also became a communist country, and communists threatened to take over El Salvador and Angola. In order to counter this, Reagan needed superior strength to negotiate effectively. So he proposed, a lot, he increased the size of our regular military, but he also proposed a bold plan called the Strategic Defense Initiative. This was a plan to use a network of satellites, anti-missile batteries, and other defensive measures to intercept nuclear attacks from the Soviets and destroy them, sometimes in space, using satellites. Now, a lot of Ronald Reagan's critics made fun of this plan and they called it Star Wars. And while the Strategic Defense Initiative was never tested, it scared the Soviets. And that's the most important thing it did. Ronald Reagan proposed to change the rules of nuclear war. Up until the Strategic Defense Initiative, the rules were mutually assured destruction. If we shoot the Soviets with our nukes, they shoot back at us, we all die. So don't go to nuclear war. But with the Strategic Defense Initiative, there's this idea that we could shoot them, and then if they try to shoot us, we could shoot their missiles down midair. And this was something that the Soviet Union could not do. They couldn't even try to make it. They were nowhere near the technological capability that we had. So rather than escalate, the Soviet Union has to figure out some way to negotiate. And so they agreed to limit nuclear weapons in the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty in 1987. And this shows the Soviet Union's resolve in the Cold War weakening. With the Reagan Doctrine, Ronald Reagan promised to aid any freedom fighters who oppose communism anywhere in the world. So this meant that Ronald Reagan was more offensive in his fight against communism. Rather than just containing the spread, Ronald Reagan was willing to help anyone trying to get rid of communism to do so. So he kind of takes the offensive against communism. In, for example, the United States aided the government of El Salvador fighting against communism. The United States sent Marines in, to Grenada in 1983 to stop a communist coup. And in Afghanistan, the United States gave money and weapons and materials to the Mujahideen rebels fighting the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. State-sponsored terrorism starts to menace the United States and the world in the 1980s. In 1983, 239 Marines are killed in Lebanon, bombings occur in West Berlin, and we start to see more unrest in the Middle East, and these terrorists are supported by countries like Syria, Libya, and Iran. Ronald Reagan didn't play around with this sort of terrorism. When the United States found solid evidence of Libya's involvement in terrorism, we just bombed the country in retaliation. Ronald Reagan was willing to use military forces to protect U.S. interests. But this commitment to fighting communism and fighting terrorism and all this actually led to the worst scandal in Ronald Reagan's presidency. Ronald Reagan's presidency gets embroiled in a scandal called the Iran-Contra scandal. This is kind of a complicated scandal, and it's kind of complicated to explain on YouTube, but in short, in 1986, the United States newspapers and press found out that America had secretly sold weapons to Iran, which is crazy, because Iran was our enemy. Remember, they captured all those Americans in the hostage crisis and tortured them for 444 days? Why on earth are we selling them weapons? Well... As it turns out, we were trying to fight communism in the country of Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, there's a communist country that is, has rebels who are fighting against communism called the Contras. And the Contras were fighting against communism and they needed money. But the United States, in order to raise funds, sold old weapons to Iran, took that money, and gave it directly to the Contras who were fighting communism there. Now, this got a lot of people in trouble and a lot of people ended up, you know, dealing with consequences in the law because it's violated the law, but no concrete proof ever said that Ronald Reagan was involved. This is something that Ronald Reagan claimed happened underneath him. His people working for him were doing this behind his back. That was Ronald Reagan's claim. Is that true or not? I don't know, but Ronald Reagan doesn't get 
impeached or anything like that. He manages to continue the rest of his presidency, and the rest of his presidency is fairly successful. Here is a picture of, we've got the Star Wars strategic defense initiative thing. You've got, say, bad guys shoot missiles. Well, we've got some satellites that see him coming. We got some lasers. We got some lasers being bounced off of mirrors. We got regular our missiles shooting down their missiles. It was a big complicated uh, method of trying to intercept incoming nuclear missiles and shoot them down. And this changed the game. It terrified the Soviet Union to think that we could actually stop them from nuclear bombing us. Here's a graph of the Iran-Contra scandal. We're not gonna worry about it too much, but essentially the idea is the United States CIA, our spies, were giving money to Israel who is then giving money to Iran or selling, we're selling weapons to Israel, who's selling weapons to Iran, who's selling that back to the United States. We're taking that money and we're giving it to the Contras in Nicaragua. And it was a very complicated mess and it got Ronald Reagan in a little bit of trouble. Now, when it comes to the culture of the 1980s, one thing that happens that we need to note is the invention of cable television or the proliferation of cable television. All of a sudden, people go from having three to seven channels to having you know, 20, 30, 40 to 100 channels, okay? With more channels, we have more diverse programs. Instead of having one channel that caters to everyone, we have specific channels that cater to specific people's interests. You want a channel all about sports, ESPN. You want a channel all about music, MTV. You want a channel just for kids, you got Nickelodeon. You want a channel just for the news, you got CNN. And instead of having you know, regular programming and hour slots where everybody had a little slice of TV, now there's channels specifically targeted to specific groups of audience. So entertainment becomes more personal. You also see entertainment become more personal with the video cassette recorder or the VCR, which allows for people to record TV and watch it later or to have movies and watch them anytime they want to instead of having to go to a movie theater and only getting to watch a movie one time and then it's out of the movie theaters forever. Now you can watch your movies as long as you want to, anytime you want to. With the Sony Walkman, you can carry music around on you. You don't have to have a, a record player or a radio. You can just carry your music wherever you want to go and listen to the songs you want to. We start to see computers become popular. They're first invented in, the personal computers invented in 1977, but they become popular in the 1980s. And the United States economy starts booming into the tech economy. We see some early tech companies like Windows and Apple really take off in the 1970s and 1980s. And this sort of business ethos that comes with the more conservative presidency of Ronald Reagan is exemplified in this slogan, greed is good. Instead of having hippies, we have the yuppies. Young people don't want to go off and, and do drugs and grow their hair out and be rock stars. Young people now want to go to the big city, get the big shot job in the office, wear a suit and tie, drive a nice car, and be a businessman. The young urban professionals. Okay, So this is how you rebel against your parents. If your parents were hippies, you don't want to grow up and be a hippie. You know, you're going to go be a businessman, mom. I don't want to do drugs and live in a commune. I want to go get a job. And that's how I'm going to rebel. That's kind of the yuppies. The young people are focused on making money and putting their lives into their work. Now, we also see a pushback against another aspect of the 1960s and 70s, and that's against drugs. The recreational drug use really proliferated in the United States in the 60s and 70s. But by the 1980s, people start to realize that a lot of these drugs are bad. Okay, They're addictive and they're deadly. And you start to see a lot of famous celebrities and a lot of America's inner cities start to be destroyed by drugs, drug-related violence, and gangs that are operating using funds from drugs. The first lady, Nancy Reagan, begins the big anti-drug campaign of Just Say No, targeting young people and trying to convince them to not do drugs. There's a lot of really interesting 1980s uh, anti-drug commercials, which I encourage you to look up. Look up uh, the egg, the fried egg, this is your brain on drugs commercial, or just the old Just Say No commercials from the 1980s. It's really interesting stuff. Now. The sexual revolution in the 60s and 70s that had been so prevalent throughout the United States all of a sudden starts to become a little bit stigmatized. 
because of a disease called acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. Okay, AIDS is a disease that is spread through blood to blood contact. Okay, and it can be transferred through relationships, uh, sexual relationships, or through drug use, especially using needles. And it's a disease that attacks people's immune syndrome, immune system. And so people don't usually die from AIDS. What AIDS does is it weakens your body's ability to fight against a disease, and then you die from, say, the common cold. Okay, you get a cold, but you have AIDS, so then it turns into pneumonia, and then people die. And this disease, when it was first really discovered in the United States, it had actually traveled from Africa to the Caribbean and then to the United States and across the world. And it was really affecting a lot of young men in America and, you know, a lot of inner cities because of drug use and because of, you know, relationships. And this led to a lot of young people dying of things like pneumonia, which had never happened, you know, just not common. And it turns out it was AIDS. And this epidemic was very scary and people didn't understand it at first. And so this led to a pushback from the days of free love of the hippies because all of a sudden it was very scary because people could have AIDS and spread it without knowing that they had it. The way AIDS works is it incubates for a while and so someone can get it and then it might be months before they have the symptoms. And so what happens is, is that they spread the disease to all these people without even knowing about it. And so it starts to push people off of doing free love and just being with anybody you want to be. And instead, people are very careful with who they choose to have relationships with. And so all those things that the hippies did, the drugs, the free love, all that stuff in the 1980s, that becomes very unpopular. Okay, so the 1980s sees a conservative turn in the United States. Here we got some Sony Walkmans, we got some VCRs, some early computers, MTV, some yuppies, we got some fashion from the 1980s, big hair, big colors, big patterns, that's the 1980s for you. Okay, just watch Stranger Things and just, or just look at like the fashion from that show and you got the 1980s. Now the 1980s sees the United States win the Cold War. What? We're gonna win the Cold War. We've been talking about it for months and we're finally gonna win. Yes, it happens in the 1980s. In 1985, a new leader of the Soviet Union appears. His name is Mikhail Gorbachev. He knows that there's problems in the Soviet Union and he wants to fix them with two programs called Glasnost and Perestroika. Glasnost was openness and Perestroika is restructuring. Essentially, he wanted to give people in Russia a little more freedom a little less restriction and a little more free market policies to help fix some of the big problems in the Russian economy. But the thing about freedom is that once people get a taste of it, it's addictive. Once they see what the free market can do and what they can see a more open society can do, they want more and more and more of it. By the late 1980s, Russia is financially collapsing. Their economy is falling apart. Their military is weakened and Poland decides to move away from communism. In June 1989, the Polish people elected a non-communist government. Everyone expected the Soviet Union to roll their tanks into Poland and force them to be a communist puppet again. But Mikhail Gorbachev let Poland go free. When other countries that were forced to be communist puppets of the Soviet Union saw that Poland broke free and it was okay, they started to break free too. All of a sudden, it was like domino effect, but instead of for communism, it was for freedom. And Eastern European countries started to break away from communism and abandon it and move towards democracy and free market policies. This happens most importantly, or one of the most symbolic moments of this, is in Germany, where East and West Germany starts to open up. For years and years and years, since the end of World War II to 1989, the Soviet Union had divided Germany, West and East Germany, and the city of Berlin had been divided between West and East Berlin. In the fall of 1989, the German people were allowed to cross the border freely, and families were reunited for the first time in decades. And all of a sudden, in that moment, they started tearing down the Berlin Wall. The German police, the Russians that were there, they didn't stop them. And the people of Germany tore down the Berlin Wall 
And this symbolized the, the, the end of the Cold War. Germany started to reunify, and by 1991, East and West Germany became Germany again. But not a communist Germany, a democracy with a free market policy. So the United States is winning the Cold War. By 1989, Ronald Reagan isn't president anymore, but he had pushed the Soviet Union to tear down the wall back in 1987. And his policies had pushed Russia to the brink of collapse. And it really falls apart in 1991. People within the Soviet Union started wanting their independence. And so states within the Soviet Union broke free. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania all declared their independence. Ukraine, the Caucasus states, the Central Asian states like Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, they wanted their freedom from the Soviet Union. Now, Mikhail Gorbachev, he said, no, I wanted to give a little bit of freedom, but not that much freedom. And he refused to let them secede from the Soviet Union, and he tried to find a compromise. But that summer of 1991, the people of Russia itself, not the Soviet Union, but Russia itself, led a coup that placed Boris Yeltsin in control of Russia, declared Russian independence from the Soviet Union, and this was the final collapse. All of a sudden, the Soviet Union just wilted apart. This happened within just a couple of years. From 1989 to 1991, Russia lost control of its communist puppets in Eastern Europe, then started to lose control of their own country, and then completely collapsed. And by 1991, there is no more Soviet Union. There's Russia and a few other countries that broke off. Now, this took Americans by surprise. We had a feeling that Russia was having trouble, but we didn't think that they were going to fall apart that quickly. But once it started to tumble, it just fell all apart. But the military spending of Ronald Reagan contributed to the economic collapse of the Soviet Union. And the general policy of containment for 45 years had kept the Soviet Union from ever being able to win. The United States was in the Cold War for the long haul. And in 1991, we won. And Ronald Reagan was really the president to deliver the finishing blow. Here's some pictures of the Berlin Wall being torn down. Here's a Boris Yeltsin and his crew. They are, you know, put, they're doing the coup that got rid of the Soviet Union. This is a very young Vladimir Putin right here. And here is kind of a picture that has some timeline. You can see the years like when Germany reunified. Poland breaks off, all the little countries like Romania, Bulgaria, all these, uh, these countries that were communist puppets of the Soviet Union, how they broke off. And you start to see, you know, in August, the Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia break off, Ukraine, Belarus, all these places break apart. And by 1991, the Soviet Union is no more. And so we win. The United States wins the Cold War because our economy was stronger, because democracy and free market capitalism was a more effective way of leading a country than communism was. And ultimately, the people of the United States stood firm against communism for 45 years, contained it, and let it die before it spread to infect the rest of the world. Ronald Reagan played a very important part of it. And in the 1980s, Ronald Reagan's leadership revitalizes the country, brings economic prosperity, changes the country's uh, cultural attitudes to be more conservative, and leads the United States to the victory in the end of the Cold War. But what are your thoughts? How about you leave a comment and tell me what you think? Do you, why do you think the Soviet Union collapsed so quickly in 1991? Why do you think the United States won the Cold War? And what does the United States do now? Our old enemy is gone. What do we do with our time? We all of a sudden won this big war that we've been fighting for 45 years. Now we gotta find a new hobby. So leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think. And I will be happy to try to put out another video very soon. And we'll finish up our lectures for the year with the discussion of the 1990s and the 2000s. Thank you everyone. Hope you have a great day.